our own homegrown Science for Peace guy from, this is a second generation, only a gray-haired second generation right now. <laughs> because when, when I knew Walter first, he was, I think you were an undergraduate in chemistry, and he started going to the UN to often to run. I think they had running uh, races and stuff. And so he became the Science for Peace uh, delegate to the UN. We, we were, he was down there all the time. And look what happens when you do that kind of thing. He's now a professor at the Royal Military College and at the Canadian Forces College in the north part of Toronto. Let's see, what I say right down about you. He's the chair of the Department of Security and International Affairs. He's the chair of the Canadian Pipwash Group. And he does a lot of, uh, he goes out into the world, into hot spots and difficult places. In 1999, he was at East Timor, the time they were having that referendum. Um, and in 2010, he was uh, at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. I understand he's on the verge of getting an appointment, am I allowed to say? Sure. <laughs> to, uh, to be in Jerusalem for the next good part of this year, second part of this year. So we have him for as long as we can hold on to him, but he's liable to move on. Well, there's Peter Shepherd. Hello. Uh, How are you, Peter? Uh, We're always telling people who we are. Uh, you get to say who you are. Uh, uh, Peter Shepherd. Uh, yeah. He's Peter Shepherd. <laughs> long standing member. Long time, long time member of Science for Peace. Thanks for coming. And Walter has written books. He's got one that came out what, a year ago called Keeping Watch, Monitoring Technology and Innovations in Peace, in operations. Uh, peace Operations. And another one that's in the works called the Emerging Global Watch, which is also, I guess, largely about uh, monitoring technologies. Is that right? Good. All right. Very good. It's all yours, Walter. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, just before you do that, I, I want to call your attention to this raft of material here because there are lots of things for you to take. Anything that's here, you're welcome to have. And you may need to know more about things once you see what's available. Uh, <clears throat> so there, there are various projects that are going on. One of them is a guy named Jacobson who's coming to lecture in what? October 15th. October 15th, a very interesting uh, topic. He's, he's good at showing how we really can get to sustainability in time before the world comes to an end. Renewable energy, yes. Huh? Renewable energy, that's what he specializes. Well, all right, fine. I, I, I think maybe it, uh, we can't keep doing this as people dribble in, so I'm going to turn it over to Walter. Well, and it does warm my heart to be back here. University of Toronto and three degrees from here. Turned out the last degree was in the wrong field. I realized after, or while I was sweating away looking through a microscope in a lab bench over in Lash Miller Chemistry Building, that I was in the wrong field. And that because of science for peace, I had um, discovered this whole field of international peace and security work. And it's become my profession since then. And I do try to apply some of that science, not to, not to leave it entirely unused. But largely these days I'm teaching political science, uh, ironically never having taken a course in it. <laughs> I'm a very mixed up person. Uh, but even when people ask me what was I doing my PhD and I said, biophysical chemistry applied to international affairs. <laughs> and uh, I kept trying to be able to do science that was for peace. And uh, fortunately I had the opportunity to work on the detection of chemical and biological warfare agents, being in the chemistry department using, uh, making artificial noses. So I was looking at the physics of membranes and uh, artificial noses. But my passion was over in ro Robart, so instead of looking through this microscope on a lab bench, I was spending hours reading history books and political science books and Robarts. And that became the way that I got, became self-taught in the field. And I'm really grateful for it, because otherwise I would still be stuck on a lab bench and, uh, and, and, and writing papers that no one reads. A lot of the papers that I write now are, are, are widely read, but uh, I do feel that you know I can talk with almost anyone about these subjects, and you can try and have some impact. And this desire for an impact 
led me to field operations, led me to um, work for the UN, serve as a consultant in New York. And, um, and now I've ended up being in the Canadian Forces College teaching uh, officers from majors to brigadiers, um, mostly these days in the command and staff course. So um, having started with marching on the streets against the militarism, I find myself part of the military industrial complex now. But uh, hopefully trying to make a difference from the inside. Showing the military that uh, peace operations are really a really legitimate military activity, that there is a lot to be gained from that. And my most recent uh, writing is about creating a peacekeeping force in Afghanistan, what we call UNAMA 2, UN Assistance Mission in Afghanistan 2. Um, one of those things that I struggle with throughout my life and through my career is when is force justified? When the U.S. launches an invasion, is it the right thing? Is it the wrong thing? Well, how do I feel about it morally, practically, you know, on all these levels? And this kind of tension is, is with me from the days of the peace movement. I remember that in Gulf War I, when, uh, I, was, uh, I was in university college, and Bernie Wood had come to lecture about why Gulf War I was a good war, and I was adamant against why it was a bad war. And now I've compared to Gulf War II, Gulf War I looks mighty good. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I was coming to terms with when can you pull the trigger. In fact, I gave a lecture last week to the students uh, in the command and staff course, and I started off by asking them as officers who uh, have sidearms when they're deployed, and when they would pull the trigger and what, what they thought was the right uh, criteria for, for that. And it turns out that what they said is very much in line with the criteria developed over the centuries through just war criteria. So I'm going to give you a presentation today on looking at the wars that Canada has fought and the wars that the United States has fought and or have fought and be able to do an assessment of them Instead of saying, okay, there, this war is just, this war is unjust, be able to say, well, maybe it's a little bit just. Try to put it on a scale. That's one of the things that you, you learn from the hard sciences, is that things are very um, infrequently binary. There are, sometimes computer circuits are ones or zeros, but in nature, everything is on a spectrum. It's on a, on a, on a line. And so it is with moral issues. You can have a very unjust war or a very just war, but most of the wars fall in between. And the way that I tested this is by asking, um, well, we, we asked over a thousand international affairs PhDs what they thought about the wars fought by Canada and the United States. And we asked them to be able to, to take the just war criteria, which I'll introduce in a minute, and then evaluate these wars. And the results were, in some ways, reinforcing of your intuitive sense, but also quite intriguing when we divide them up between people who identify themselves as left-wing versus right-wing. So, let me continue with uh, the slide presentation. First of all, I showed this in the command and staff course. I thought it would really summarize a lot of my feelings about, about going to war. And in fact, some people feel uncomfortable with having me lecture to officers because I'm, I'm making them think. Think, is this the right thing to do? And so, when you've got your soldiers all lined up, well, is that the right moment to think, you know, is this a, is this a right war? And I have to say yes. The thinking soldier, the thinking officer is the best officer. They'll, they'll get the larger context. And also they'll have to think about the criteria about their own use of force. And that involves um, very much similar considerations to the just war criteria. Now, if you look on uh, where just war fits into, into thought about the world, I, I'll um, put to two extremes here and say that just war criteria doesn't cover those two extremes. It doesn't cover the absolute pacifist who thinks it's never justified to use force. And I kind of admire the people who are absolute pacifists. They're so principled that they can't find any reason to use force. And if the world were all absolute pacifists, you wouldn't there couldn't be a, a war. But the world isn't like that, and there are those who use force. And I believe sometimes you have to use force in order to constrain force. The other people are on the opposite end of the spectrum who think unlimited force. There's no, there's anarchy in the world and that there should be no limit on the na nation's capability of using force or even individual, individuals using force. And also just war theory doesn't deal with, with that group. But it comes, those who try and figure somewhere in between those two extremes, 
there is, um, there is uh, reasons or criteria for saying when is the use of force justified. And that's where just for war comes in. And in fact, uh, when Barack Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize and gave his uh, acceptance speech in Oslo in 2009, he uh, referred to the just war criteria, saying that this concept of just war emerged, suggested that war was justified only when it meets certain preconditions. If it is waged as a last resort in self or in self-defense, if the force is used is proportional, and if, wherever possible, civilians are spared from violence. That's just a few of the just war criteria. But he did encourage all of us to think in new ways about notions of just war and the imperatives of a just peace. Now, the just war tradition, as uh, was included in that Obama quote, has a presumption of peace, meaning that you shouldn't use force on a national level, and you could apply it down on a personal level, tactical level for the soldier, you shouldn't use force except under certain preconditions, certain criteria, because there's a presumption of peace, that people will act peacefully unless they meet uh, conditions. And in just war literature, there's four to eight conditions that are typically cited. I tend to use seven of them. And I like them because they have answered the questions, the basic questions about the use of force in a, in a very intelligent way. The five W's and how, or six W's if you like the W and how, then they've answered that, the question by asking uh, about force. Why use force? Well, just war tells you that you need a just cause. I mean, you need a reason. You need to have the right intent so that you can't um, have uh, motivations or ulterior motives behind what you're doing that are not consonant with your declared cause. And you need to have a net benefit. If the end result of your fighting is going to be more, is going to be more negative, then it's not wise. It doesn't meet the, the net benefit criteria. Who should authorize force? Well, the, the, the theory, the uh, tradition says that it should be a legitimate authority. And uh, the modern interpretation of that is legitimate authority under international law, which means the UN Security Council in accordance with the UN Charter. What uh, means uh, can be used? Well, proportionate means. You shouldn't use a nuclear weapon after someone steps on your foot. You should use uh, weapons and means that are proportional to the atrocity that was committed or to the action that's trying to be corrected. When should you use it? Well, always as a last resort. That means after all the peaceful options have been exhausted. Um, now, that's often hard to meet that last resort because there may be always more peaceful options, but let's say reasonable options have been exhausted or are pretty uh, well established that they would fail. Where can you use force? Well, only on military targets, not on civilian ones. So that comes clearly out of the just war tradition and of modern international law, the laws of armed conflict. And how do you use force while well, you use it in right conduct? And that is part of what uh, in the just war tradition we call use in bello, as opposed to the use ad bellum, which is the criteria of going to war, which is the criteria of being in war. So what, uh, what we did in our studies, we, we defined each of these terms for the people we were doing, submitting this survey to. Just cause being a right, fair, ethical, honorable, righteous, moral, purpose or reason to apply armed force. <coughs> right intent, uh, some people interpret right intent as meaning that you have the intent to create peace. We interpret it in a different fashion, but both are compatible, as the degree to which the actual motivation behind the use of force is the same as the declared motivation. To get, behind, get uh, away from the ulterior motives that somebody might have, a president might have, in order to launch a war that might benefit his popularity, even if it wasn't good for the country. So similarly, we define the group various terms for the people taking the, the survey, and then we uh, also ask them the causes. Well, what, what do you consider a just cause? So we, we thought about seven just causes, seven causes, and we asked them to rank them. And then they came out with this uh, scale from number one cause down to number seven. And then we also asked them to identify themselves where they were on the political spectrum. 
Do you identify yourselves as, as left, center left, center right, or um, right part of the spectrum? So first of all, the general trend. We saw that the most justified cause was to defend one's country against an attack that has already begun. So pure self-defense. Moving on to stop an attack on one's country that is certain and fast approaching. That gets into the imminent category. Then, to protect the lives of civilians threatened by violence in other countries. That means a humanitarian intervention. And you can see that using the US uh, colors for the political spectrum, we have the liberals um, and, or the left thinking that was much more just, whereas the humanitarian intervention for those who are on the right is uh, less uh, important as a reason. To show solidarity with an allied country, well, here that was higher on the right than it was on the left, but not that much higher. To prevent an attack on one's country that is thought to be probable, that's the preemptive attack issue. And that is, uh, we're both about right, and but it was quite far down, fifth in terms of the justifications. To avenge a prior attack on one's country by another country, here the right thought it was much more appropriate and just to avenge an attack than the left did. But fortunately, neither side thought that it was a good reason to acquire new territory or resources from another country. It was the last of those reasons. So this is the way that we were able to look at the range of uh, possible motivations and classify them, including uh, by looking at how people on the left and right of the political spectrum saw, saw it. That's just the idea of the just cause criteria. Similarly, we did similar things with the other criteria. But let me give you actual the, the results of the study of the wars actually fought. We asked them to say, to what extent do you agree, agree that there was just cause for the following war? And we said, if they clearly agreed, then, then we'd be up here at plus three. And we had a scale, if they were neutral about it, they didn't agree, didn't disagree, or they're minus three if they completely disagree that it was a just cause or whatever criteria we asked them. So really, you get a seven point spread, including the zero, uh, in this scale. And then if you take seven criteria, um, you have uh, seven items you can take an average of, and we call the average the just war index. It's an overall consideration of the way in which the respondents consider whether a war is just or unjust based on the average of the seven just war criteria. Now let me give you an example from my own, uh, in my own thinking, it's just so you know it, how I think, and then we'll talk about how the um, actual respondents thought. Here's Gulf War One versus Gulf War Two. George Bush Senior, George Bush Junior, 1991, 2003. The just uh, cause, declared cause for Gulf War One was to expel Iraq out of Kuwait, which it had annexed uh, half a year earlier. In Gulf War Two, the justice of the cause was the presumption that there were weapons of mass destruction and these needed to be disarmed, as well as the presumption of terrorists within Iraq that had to be taken care of. So I thought that, thinking now, that the Gulf War I, it seemed pretty reasonable to repel an aggression that had taken place, one of the most blatant aggressions since the Second World War. Uh, Gulf War II, well, you think you might have weapons, and it's a preemptive thing because Iraq isn't, isn't actually uh, deploy those weapons, and um, it's preemptive because it might attack you in the future. That's a pretty weak scenario, so the most that I could give it was a minus one. But it was actually an unjust cause to some extent. The, the right intent was not perfect. It wasn't plus three. We all know that George Bush Sr. and Jr. were oil men, and that they were very concerned about the oil in the world, and so there was a, there was a selfish motive there. But on the other hand, you know, we didn't want to see large reserves of the worlds of oil, um, which uh, Saddam Hussein had uh, taken from Kuwait, be in his hands so he could manipulate the world oil market. So there's some justification in that. But the intent of the United States after the end of the Cold War was to try and right a wrong by expelling Iraq out of Kuwait. Uh, the right intent in here, I'd be generous if I give them zero. But uh, for George Bush Sr., I mean, come after September 11th, and then what he sees as a successful operation in Afghanistan, a lot of the intent was to remain the war president. 
So I saw, I re read that a lot in, into uh, George Bush's motives. And indeed, his uh, daily presidential beef, beef, brief uh, starts off with a biblical quote from the Old Testament about uh, using force. And uh, so I, I question the uh, right intent uh, of, the, um, of the president at the time. So at least, uh, you know, it's hard to actually ascribe intent because you don't really know what get into the person's brain. But the most that I could give it was zero. The net benefit was, in 1991, the expulsion of Iraq from Kuwait and the Kuwaitis getting back their own government and their own uh, oil wells. And, and there's only been slight improvement in democracy in Kuwait, but at least it wasn't under a dictator and it wasn't under annexation. The net result of Gulf War II was highly questionable. You had so many deaths. Um, 5,000 more American soldiers died in Iraq than civilians died in 9-11. So 5,000 uh, soldiers, plus over 100,000 Iraqi civilians died uh, in the invasion and its aftermath, mostly in the Sunni Muslim attacks. They're still going on now with uh, bombings going on, killing up, upwards of 50 people to 100 people uh, per bombing. And that's just horrendous. And it, at the time of the, of the Gulf War, I was thinking this will cause Iraq to be split up into three different uh, territories. The Sunni territory, the Shia territory, and the Kurdish territory. And to a large extent, that has happened. So the net benefit is hardly positive. I mean, yes, there were democratic elections there, but uh, the current government is really not interested in sharing power. Legitimate authority. The Security Council uh, authorized the repulsion of the Iraqi invasion through resolution 6678. Uh, six, and um, the international community was really behind the United States in that. The United States was pushed by many countries to go to the UN, they did it, and they got the authorization. It wasn't unanimous, but there were no vetoes. In Gulf War II, President George W. Bush said, well, we're gonna ask all those countries on the Security Council to put their cards down on the table, and we're gonna make it an estimate, a judgment, about whether they, um, where they stand on this issue, because if you're not with us, you're against us. But then they saw not only would they face three vetoes in the Security Council, they wouldn't even get the mandatory nine votes to be able to get a, the majority required to pass a resolution, a sim, uh, the resolution. So then they said, no, we don't need a resolution. And they used very weak legal reasoning, saying it goes back to that original Gulf War I resolution, 687, which is the immediately after the Gulf War, it's called the Mother of All Resolutions, um, uh, making demands of uh, Iraq. So I thought uh, legitimate authority. He didn't get the Security Council. Um, he did get a congressional approval, but in terms of international law, that's really not, not nearly enough, and it's minus two. Last resort, well, you've given Iraq half a year of sanctions, pretty tough ones. Um, and so it looked like Saddam Hussein wasn't budging, even when the Secretary General went to Baghdad and pleaded for Saddam Hussein to withdraw from Kuwait. In the case of Gulf War II, Gulf War II it was really an optional war. There was no sense of it had to be done now or be too late. There were lots of rumors about uh, Iraq assembling uh, biological weapons and nuclear weapons. and, and uh, but the UN Special Commission had been able to do very thorough investigations. They destroyed over 2,000 tons of chemical weapons and their precursors. They had, the IEA had done inspections and really couldn't show no evidence of a nuclear weapons program. And maybe there were some biological weapons in a suitcase somewhere, but those were not militarily significant weapons. So you really didn't have the urgency. It wasn't a last resort. It was an optional war. Proportionality and means, well, you used the means in 1991 to expel uh, Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Now, they weren't perfect. I mean, the highway of death in 1991, where they just bombed any vehicle that was leaving Kuwait, often with stolen goods in it, but just created this, uh, this five kilometer train of, uh, of blown up vehicles, really wasn't proportional means. But overall, the United States didn't proceed into Iraq. They stayed uh, within the boundaries of Kuwait. And so, that uh, was overall proportional means. In Gulf War II, you yeah, invaded the country. You, uh, you completely took over the government. You took over the entire responsibility from everything in 
a country. Invasion is about the most strongest measure you can have. So I thought that that was a very disproportional response to the presumed presence of, of weapons of mass destruction. For right conduct, the Go 4 one had some embarrassments. At one time they dropped bombs that uh, killed a few hundred people in a shelter in Baghdad. But it wasn't uh, nearly as embarrassing as, as Gulf War II. Actually, I don't know why I'm getting the same scores, but Gulf War II with Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, and um, lots of other uh, really terrible incidents like the Fallujah massacres and um, the various attacks that the Americans had made on civilians, whether it be in small or large groups. That was really abominable. The, what do you call it, collateral murder by people in helicopters shooting uh, photographers and that just without giving due care for the civilian population. So if you take all of these criteria, these seven criteria, and you average them, you get a plus two for Gulf War I and a minus one for the Gulf War II. That just about, I thought that's a pretty good summary of how I feel overall. Pretty just, you know, one of the more just conflicts, and quite unjust. I mean, not totally unjust, but pretty unjust for Gulf War II. Now, let's see what these 100 experts said when, uh, when they responded. They were, they were asked to review 18 American conflicts and, and 12 American, Canadian conflicts. These are conflicts that have been fought since 1900. They are conflicts involving combat. So um, the, the survey looks like this. They had to say, to what extent do you agree, agree or disagree that the U.S. had just cause to use armed force in the following conflict? And so you look at World War I, they have to say, how just was it on this scale from minus 3 to plus 3, World War II, and so on, going through 18 conflicts. So it was very demanding, and I'm very grateful to the people who stayed on and, and actually did the survey. And here's one of the results, Gulf War I and Gulf War II came up with quite similar to what I had done earlier in terms of the, doing the evaluations. These are the averaging over 100 responses, giving a net result of plus 1.5. Let's see, what did I give? Two. Uh, two, right. So they didn't do it as highly as I did, and minus one, uh, 1.2. And what did I give? It? One, minus minus 1.1. 1. 1. 1. 1. So pretty close. If you want to be able to put that on percentage scales, I mean, universities we use percentages for grade, grading. Here is 50% uh, is the, is the um, zero mark, and then plus three is the 100. This would be a 75% mark uh, in terms of you know pretty uh, good mark, and 30% uh, abysmal failure for a Gulf War One you know, on a justness scale. Now we're going to get in the. A lot, of, a lot of information in this chart. This is all 18 conflicts with all seven criteria. You find that World War II is justified almost plus two. So that's pretty high. And um, you can see from the different criteria, they're all pretty good, except there was that one, right conduct. Now the right conduct may be low in World War II, possibly because of the use of the um, fire bombing or the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So uh, it's a little bit of an anomaly for a conflict to be so high, but that's what hit World War II was the uh, use of uh, uh, was the conduct problems. Moving down, we've got anti-piracy mission in Somalia, which is a, a recent mission, current mission. Then uh, Gulf War One, that's the one I just covered. So as I mentioned, uh, 1.5 on this scale. Let's see why did I have that? I'm not quite sure why I have that 1.5 in here. I have oh yeah, there's 1.5. So, yeah, it's consistent. Gulf War I, and then World War I. So World War I not being quite as justified. It was a tangling web of European commitments, so I could see why they might not evaluate the same way as Gulf War II. Bosnia intervention meant when NATO uh, responded uh, a few months before and then dealt strongly after the Srebrenica massacre to use force on the Serb Serbs. The Kosovo War was the uh, bombing campaign in 1999 in NATO, and it didn't actually have um, NATO a UN authorization. So it was um, not UN authorized, yet it still had a lot of, you could say, it may have been illegal, but it still had a lot of moral authority, at least in my view. So, um, what did I say? Uh, Bosnia, I mentioned the mission, uh, missed Korean War. So that was in 1950 to 53. 
There you had uh, a UN Security Council resolution uh, possible because Russia was absent from the Security Council. And you had uh, the first time the world had taken collective action through an international organization to stop an aggression, which was the North Korean aggression, and attempt to unify the Koreas through force. The Iraqi no-fly zone, which was applicable for the United States, it was imposed uh, through an interpretation of Security Council resolutions, but it was there to protect the Kurds in the north and the Shiites that are on the south, uh, north and south no-fly zones. Haiti intervention, which will hardly needed a shot. It was uh, naval boats off the coast of Haiti, which forced the junta in 1993 to step down and bring Aristide back into power. Then Kosovo intervention I mentioned already. Operation Enduring Freedom Afghanistan, that's the current ICE, uh, no, that's the US mission, it's the, what, part of what George Bush's global war on terror. So they gave Af Afghanistan a fairly high ranking, I'm not sure I would give that much. And ISAF Afghanistan, pretty much a similar ranking, whereas I see quite a difference between the NATO operation and the US operation there, which is um, mostly to kill terrorists. The global War on Terror actually got some negative scores for some of the criteria, like right conduct, proportionality, um, and you can see that it really dips down. And then we get this whole series here, which are, well, um, getting net negative. Lebanon intervention, Ronald Reagan's intervention in 1983, where he uh, had, where a couple hundred Marines were blown up in the barracks um, after they were going into Lebanon trying um, help resolve the civil war in Lebanon. Libya bombing, also Ronald Reagan, 1986, where they dropped bombs on Gaddafi's compound, killing one of his children, and um, losing a U.S. jet. Um, and definitely not, neither Lebanon nor Libya were UN authorized. Neither was the Panama intervention, which was to over, overthrow um, Noriega, or the Grenada intervention to prevent communism. Remember, this was still the Cold War. It was 1983 also, or 84. Um, and that's to prevent uh, Grenada from turning into a socialist state. So that was, that was their justification, as you can see. The experts here are quite negative. The Vietnam War got really down there. The justifications uh, for the U.S. involvement in Vietnam with over 60,000 lives, American lives lost, countless damage, so much resources, so much division in the United States. Um, and uh, you know, the arguments are, are, are many why that war is considered to be one of America's worst wars. But Iraq actually was even worse, according to these experts. It gives the, the, the big score here, uh, minus 1.25. So. This is what they ended up. Um, I'd be interested later on if you want to make comments of where you agree or disagree with that. But it's actually nice to see things A, on a spectrum, B, see what the experts think, and see if your own opinion is radically different. So uh, we'll, we'll have a discussion about that. Sorry, what are the colors in those bars? These are the seven just war criteria. So adding them up, um, just cause, last resort, uh, legitimate authority, um, net benefit, proportionality, right conduct, and right intent. So they're, 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 you can see this, the total score is here. Well, it's it's a bit um, there's a bit of mathematics involved in putting these on here, but that gives you a sense of how you get the total score based on the proportions. So would, would yeah. tell, if you said you had a full sp political spectrum of respondents, why would some of the much Hardcore Republicans have said, "Oh, all wars are right." Why would you have a more attenuated bars? Right. Uh, well, actually, that's right on my next slide. So here's the division between the political right, the solid bar, and the political left, the dotted bar. And so these are the same conflicts I just listed. Now, the right wing thinks that all the wars the U.S. fought were justified. <laughs> but you can see that that when you get down to these ones. It, it says it's less justified. So they're all slightly above zero here. So um, I'm averaging. Now, it happens to be that I, I had a pool of academics, which meant that there was many more left-leaning people in that pool than there were right-leaning. That's just the way that, that academics is. I didn't to do this with any bias. So of the 100 experts that filled out the survey, we got the, um, about 80% of them were on the left. And how do you... 
And that's totally, as far as you know, completely representative of academics in general? I can't say that. I, I, don't, have I, don't, I don't have the statistical authority to do it. All I can say is these were the 100 people that responded to our survey. Please. Um, so does left and right mean operationally Democrat and Republican? Um, in the United States, they, they tend to have those uh, affiliations, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. How did you determine that? Generally? We asked them themselves, where do you position yourself on the political spectrum? Okay. Left, center left, center, center right, right, and... Because it'd be complicated because the Democrats do a lot of those wars and stuff. So, yeah. That's true. Also, if you look at which presidents were doing what, if you have these sort of, um, those, uh, with complex actually, I, I have a, did a table up on which wars were with which Democrat or Republican presidents, um, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't map out really that well. But the important thing that I saw from this um, from the tables we drew is that the left and right put the wars in pretty similar order. You can see they come down here. But the left tends to go much more in the unjust territory, but you know when you consider Iraq versus World War II. Even the right's willing to say, yes, World War II was far more justified than Iraq. So I like this uh, because it actually shows some bridge building. There's, not, there's still a big difference, but it's, there's a lot of things that they, you could agree upon. Peter is turning to look at it the other way. <laughs> <laughs> He's got his head this way. Uh, World War II, World War I, Bosnia, and it's, it's exactly the same criteria set, uh, set that I showed on the previous slide. A little more clarity here, same order. So what about Canada? Well, so we're pretty lucky for a country. Um, the only country that, that the only war that scored negative was the Boer War. <laughs> safely, safely moved. Yeah, and um, you know we even looked at that and found that the U.S. response gave uh, much more negative scores than the Canadians did on the Boer War. Whereas you know some Canadians think that uh, that uh, helping the British Empire was a, was a noble thing. In fact, I'm a professor at the Royal Military College in Kingston. And, and we have a big arch there, a memorial arch, and it's uh, dedicated to the ex-cadets of the Royal Military College of Canada who gave their lives for the empire. Mm -hmm. Every time I pass that on Highway 2, I just shake my head and say, you know, what were we thinking? You know, giving your lives for an empire? But built in 1922, that was still the, the thinking in the country. So we do otherwise pretty well, and you can, it follows pretty closely to what you see in the United States, World War II, Somalia, uh, that's the anti-piracy mission, World War I, Bosnia, Korea, OEF, Kandahar, that's where I myself was uh, asked to go to Kandahar and participate in OEF on January 15, 2006. And I said, uh, no thanks, I don't believe in the mission because Operation Enduring Freedom was part of this global war on terror. Next day, the man I was replaced was killed in a suicide bombing, Glenberry. And I was very grateful uh, that I had that assessment today, and I didn't end up in Canada. I'm willing to go to dangerous places like Congo and, and to Jerusalem uh, later on this year. But uh, Canada was not something that I would go under a UN mission, but not under Operation Zero Freedom. Anyhow, I tend to evaluate those two as pretty similar, which I disagree with. I wrote a whole paper on why these two missions were, were quite different. Afghanistan overall, um, so one point. Uh, or so, and you know, only 50% of the Canadian population supported Canada being in Afghanistan, and that was pretty, held pretty constant over the term we were in Kandahar. So it's not really a good basis to wage a war. World War One, Kosovo, uh, ISAF, Canada, uh, Kandahar, and then the World War. So, but by and large, we managed to miss uh, Vietnam, thank God, to the Pearson, managed to miss. Uh, Iraq, thanks to Britain. And that was, uh, yeah, we're a really grateful country for that. Now I thought, well, what about the legitimate authority looking at that criteria? How did the experts score that? And here you go from the most legitimate, World War II, to the least legitimate, being Iraq. And then I said, did uh, the UN Security Council pass a resolution? And did the US Congress? The case of the Security Council was, was not applicable. This, the UN was created in the, in the ending days of, uh, of World War II. But yes, yes, not applicable to World War I. Possibly yes, yes, yes. And then no, 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 no. So it looked like there is a mapping of why they gave scores, including the negative scores, when there was no authorization by the UN Security Council. 
However, um, the U.S. Congress pretty much authorized almost all of it, so it's yes is all the way down here. So you can find that, uh, that in the expert evaluations, they used uh, international authorization as well as national authorization. Now, I have to do my own critique. I'm an academic after all, and so I created this just war index, and it's the average of the criteria, but maybe some criteria should be weighted more than others are more important. And so we're exploring that now with, uh, with different um, uh, statistical means to be able to weight the criteria. And unjust rewards of any criteria is negative. So what happens if all your criteria are positive, but one is extremely negative? Does that make that mean that it's an unjust war? My just war analysis tends to take the average, but maybe you should use the preconditions. If one precondition doesn't exist, then you can't launch the war. So that's uh, all in the area of, of interpretation. Uh, I don't know if there are inappropriate criteria. I just happen to like those criteria a lot. And so I've, um, I've, I've been constantly trying to think, there can't be a theory that's this good. What's wrong with just war? And that's part of the challenge I'll put out to you. Uh, are there any problems with these criteria? Are there other criteria that should be included? Sort of thing. So uh, that's part of the intellectual challenge to look at this issue. So, I'm going to just conclude about the just war, uh, that I think it provides a very good analytical framework. In fact, when the creators of the responsibility to protect, uh, which was um, sponsored by the US, uh, by the Canadian government, they decided to take the just war criteria and apply it to humanitarian intervention. So they took those seven criteria and they, they looked for the justice of the cause and reasonable prospect of success or net benefit. And it, uh, it, it's really an application that and I haven't found a better theory or a better set of uh, considerations than just what theory to consider about when to go to war or not. As I say, I'd be, uh, I'm, I'm open to it and I'm really looking for a strong, the strongest arguments against that so that I can have a better balance in my mind. Now the criteria can be quantified, that's one of the results of the study. Is uh, we try to be pioneering in here. We said let's not be consider okay check mark just cause check mark right intent uh, X for our last resort. We said you know these are all on a spectrum. So that's the contribution of considering these things uh, from minus three to plus three and putting them on in a numerical scale uh, quantification. And then we also did some analysis of left and right in our study, uh, looking at the, uh, the similarity and dissimilarities between uh, left and right. And we found a similar ranking, which, which I consider one of the most important results. And we've just finished the paper this week, and we're submitting it to the Journal of Peace Research in Oslo to be able to publish this, and that will be one of our major findings. So we found that uh, for U.S. conflicts, uh, the majority of wars were above zero, with World War II at the top, and they had a number of conflicts below zero, I think six of them, including Iraq, Vietnam, Panama, Grenada, and the Global War on Terror. The Canadian conflicts, as I mentioned, comes out looking pretty well uh, with uh, all but one war. But we fought fewer wars and we fought fewer ones that were on the negative side of the just war index. This is a framework for analysis. It doesn't provide the answer. It's not like you can, um, you can say, okay, the next war, we're going to determine on the just war index and it will tell us whether we should go to war or not. Because one person's interpretation of a just cause is another person's interpretation of an unjust cause. So there's a, there's a vast uh, issue of interpretation. How do you interpret the criteria? But I find the criteria are sufficiently uh, precise to be useful. They're not so general that it can mean anything. And they're not so, so specific that it, do, it doesn't allow for important considerations. So, that's one of the reasons I like them. They have a subjective element for sure, but it, it's a framework for analysis. And of course, the value of the framework is the extent to which you can actually apply opinion and argument and facts and evidence to um, the case. And that's the real value when you go into just war analysis. It's not the end result, but the, the things you have to think about, the pros and cons when you're considering each numerical value, why it's not a perfect three, and why it has to be a one or a two. Elements of just war theory need, are needed to convince the, the lead and lead the population, soldiers and partners. So these, all these seven criteria are important factors in consideration. One of the things I didn't show is we also ask people 
to evaluate the war as a whole, each of those 18 plus 12 wars. And we, um, we then said, what are their overall evaluations versus the average, the JWI? And we saw that they had a 0.99% correlation. So the criteria that we were asking were good indicators, good measures of the overall justness of the conflict. That's another finding from the study. So now this is when I get to, towards the end, and I want to be more engaging with the audience, and, and I'd like to ask your opinion. So we'll kind of take a situation, and I'm going to ask you which, which conflict, hopefully let's try and deal with the one that's looming, um, you might want to consider. And we're going to go on a minus 3 to plus 3 scale. So what would you like to look at? Iran bombing, which Israel is contemplating, Libya campaign of last year, um, or the Syrian intervention, the humanitarian intervention by NATO. So we have to set some parameters about what it means, and we can actually see whether in this room we want to come up with a score for these different uh, criteria. Any preferences about what to, what to tackle? Libya. You want to do Libya? Okay. Well, that's my opinion. I, you know, wants to do Let's start Libya right now. And um, anybody else want to do another one? Is that Syrian? Syrian. <laughs> okay, we got all three. Okay. <laughs> I run out of chalk for you, but I'll put it right up there. What I'll do is I'll do them faster and we'll go through all three. It'll be just kind of fun. So, justice of the cause for the Libya campaign. Okay, um, all right, before I subject, my, subject you to my views, I'm uh, opening the floor. What was the cause in Libya? An ambassador was killed. Well, you're talking about the uh, Libya intervention now, you're not talking about last year? Oh, okay, sorry, I thought that's what we were talking about. Because no, well, you talked about imminent, right? Sorry. All right. I'm thinking about the 2011. Okay. So, you know, the Gaddafi forces were already penetrating into Benghazi. And the U.S. president had a resolution in 1970 and 73 saying um, that there had to be a no fly zone and protection of civilians. It's true, I was thinking about the future, but this is. All right, so what are we. Okay, let's talk about another Libyan intervention. No one's talking about another Libyan intervention now, right? Well, they're on alert. I mean, uh -huh. I, I guess that's the first yeah. thing that looped into my mind because you said, you know, <laughs> impending, and right, I think yeah. we're all reading the same news stories. And oh, yeah. Such. I, I would think that that's because they Okay, so let's do it in 2012. I mean, yeah. they killed the ambassador and, uh, and other staff. As so we're talking about a U.S. intervention. This would be a unilateral or probably with Libyan government permission? Yeah. Based, on, um, based on Barack Obama's rhetoric last night. He would want to collaborate with the Libyan government yeah. to, to do this. They're so hesitant to put boots on the ground, you know. So I mean, I could see another air, air operations beginning or something like that. Yes. Boots on the ground. I, for myself, I think that's it's pretty infeasible. So maybe we'll just drop Libya because um, I can't imagine that. You know, they might put Marines in to guard the embassy in Tripoli, but I don't imagine that they would do an intervention. To, to achieve what goal? I mean, to withdraw it could be a, a non-combatant evacuation operation. Mm -hmm. But then you're really talking about two different things. You can say that something would be just, but not too smart to do because it wouldn't, it, for practical reasons, it's not a good idea. Right. And but I think a lot of the smartness also comes in there. I mean, your net benefit is going to be tied in with, with uh, whether it's practical or not. If, if you're not going to get a net benefit, then it won't be. A, it won't be very practical either. But I, I, I have to say that I agree with your basic point that the just war theory is an ethical framework. So you we were talking about the ethics of war. We're not talking about sort of the practicality of it. So it's true that you could see that there would be some war that is uh, highly just or highly unjust and at the same time is extremely practical or in, impractical. Um, and it, it might not map on the point. But I mean, I think that's true of Syria right now. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, but it, 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 if you do it, you're still going to have a terrible mess, so it's better not to try. Okay, so let's presume, uh, let's presume, let's presume that the Russia and China allow a Security Council authorization for intervention within one year from now. I'm, I'm skeptical that it would work. All right, but we have, in order to do the uh, analysis, we have to presume something. Okay, you can presume that they won't allow it. So then it's a NATO uh, operation without Security Council authorization, like the 1999 Kosovo bombing. Right? Okay. 
Okay. So what would be the justice of the cause of going into Syria? So we had, a, let's say, a NATO operation in, uh, in, in Syria. NATO led, but they bring in Turkey and lots of other Probably Turkey would play a major role. Justice of the cause to end the war, right? End the civil war. What do you want to give that? Anybody want to give it a negative score for the justice of the cause? Yeah. Plus one? Let's see, plus two? Plus two. Plus two. Plus two. Plus two. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know what? who you're intervening on the yeah, half of. I mean, that's, you know, the balance of sports. I would say that about Libya, too. I mean, you know. What would you like to give out? I, I, I want to take all views of the count or, or uh, you know, give me scores. I just don't. I'd give it a zero. Zero, okay. All right, so I'm going to give uh, the plus two would be in the first one. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Uh, it's, it's important to also have debate here. Part of the value of this, this framework is that you're going to be able to bring out new points of view that help you get a better understanding of the situation. Yes? Um, just to uh, piggyback off of that point, um, when we're, we're intervening, we, we have to have a, a, a clear understanding of, of, of what the end result is. <coughs> is right mm -hmm. so i think that will play into the the intent it's not you will ultimately have to pick a side when you're intervening in this war not for so peacekeepers but for nato they would like they'd have to do the same sort of thing in syria as they did in libya mm -hmm. because uh, they really be fighting against the government even though in libya they were, they're protection of civilians they, they in, in that practice they were only shooting on government forces so we'll, we'll, we'll have, it's all filled with assumptions in the future. Because they we're operating, we won't really see how the, any concrete proposal for an intervention now is, it's very hypothetical. But it's still useful to look at. The right intent. So what about the intent to intervene in Syria? You want to give it a big score, a low score? Plus, a plus plus, plus score. It's plus. Plus one or plus two or plus? One, one or two, but not more. Maybe I'll say 1.5. Anybody want to radically disagree with that one? My intent? Okay. Legitimate authority. So this is all our assumption. What does what do Russia and China do in the Security Council? Uh, yeah, we're talking about a NATO or Western intervention. Um, I think Turkey would play a larger role in that. That might be Turkish led with NATO support. Um, legitimate authority. You know, I don't know what. Uh, we either, we either go, it's going to either be a plus two or a minus two, depending on whether there's a, this is the um, Security Council, yeah. yeah. So I really, really have to put in both scores because we don't know what would happen in that case. The net benefit, okay. That's, that's <laughs> where the sticking point is, you know, you might have everything else a three, and the net benefit is minus something, then you can't go. Uh, what do you think of net benefit of a Western intervention? Let's say it's a um, no-fly zone plus some limited forces on the ground. What would be the net benefit? Well, I mean, in Syria, obviously, you get rid of uh, Assad and presumably try to foster some sort of democracy, but I think that's the goal. But then uh, stop the, obviously, stop the, the killing of civilians. Okay, so that would be on the positive side? side. Yeah, we know the positive side, but I guess I, I don't want to go veer off on too much of a tangent with the question you asked earlier about. Okay, well, are there any other criteria, or should we think should we be thinking about these things a bit deeper? Um, the first thing that popped into my mind that the net benefit sort of touches on that. But if I were going to war, one of the criteria for me would be not just net benefit, but the end game. And before the conflict actually starts, do you have? even an idea or some sort of roadmap, if not a blueprint, for what your end game scenario would be. Okay, so in this case, for example, Assad is gone, and obviously the atrocities, the killings have stopped, but then what, like, do you leave, or do you, like, in what way do you try to foster those good things? And it seems to me in a lot of conflicts, and certainly in, um, in the most recent, recent Iraq um, war, there really was no end game. It's like, okay, let's kill the bad guy and then we're out of there. And then, and then what? There's a bad human. This is sort of what Meadows, if I interpret what you were saying correctly, what you were sort of suggesting just now as well. And that's the first thing. So I, I don't know if it's an additional criterion. However, 
a net benefit could be good, okay, as Saad has gone and we can agree, it's kind of, well, I'm not going to express what I think of him, but let's say that would be a net benefit, certainly, but then what? Like, what exactly. So if you don't so have... So there's chaos afterwards. Right, so, yeah. I mean, to me, it's, yeah, to me, to me, it sounds like an additional criterion, but it, it sort of plays into the net benefit. There was a good point, the massacre of Alawites might happen afterwards. I, I'm worried about wider Middle East. I mean, when you get the American boots on an uh, Arab country, oh boy, another one, you know, it's mm -hmm. gonna, so many people, so many Arabs will revolt against that. You could get, you could get other terrorist attacks. You could, uh, you know, it's, the, the benefit is, could be quite negative as well. So, um, I, I don't know, I would, uh, let's put it from uh, plus two, you know, seeing a side gone down to minus one if, uh, if, if it becomes another Iraq. Minus two. Minus two, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> minus two. Yeah, the uh, last resort. So that's an interesting consideration. I mean, how many thousands have to die before we do something in Iran and Syria? Um, on the other hand, what peaceful means do you have? Yeah. Why is it we? So why isn't it maybe Turkey or you know, some... Well, I, I'm now saying NATO, oh, yes. NATO type, which could be Turkey. Well, okay, but then it's not that, is it NATO leading or leading yeah, a decision? Yeah, you know, including Tur Turkey lead, Turkey lead. I can, I can actually foresee there'll be some border incident and that'll be used as a pretext to be able to Turkey to go in, seize territory, they get a safe area, and the rebels start to gain territory, and then NATO says, okay, we're going to protect that safe territory so you can go and... But then you're back on your intent question because Turkey's got some intent that maybe others don't have with regard to Kurdistan, right. Kurds, and so on. So yeah, that's an important story. Right. So um, last resort. So what do you want? To, is that going to be positive? I, think. I have a real weird thing on that last resort. I mean, I nobody ever thinks about no about resistance, civil resistance. But now it's pretty hard to do. You, I mean, that should have been thought about two years yeah, ago. Yeah, there was demonstrations. I mean, they didn't uh, do sensible, really strategic analysis of civil resistance. No. Mm -hmm. But had you thought about that, had they thought about that, then that would have a much better chance of success than anything else that you got going. And I mean, there are these. There's a wonderful book recently. I can't think of the channel and somebody uh, showing that the, the proportion of of wars or uh, changes of regime that have come from civil resistance and versus you know violence, and um, about half of them are coming from civil resistance, and the ones that come from civil resistance are more significantly more su successful okay. than the ones that come from war. So that's the, the last resort is, you know, you, you don't have to make to do that. That's, that's, that's true. Right I mean, if you try to pass the resistance against uh, Bashir's, Bashar's all forces, you'd just be mowed down. True, yeah. So, the last resort, we'll give that a fairly high score, plus two. Any uh, contrary views? Uh, proportionality of means, well, that all depends on what means is used. They use a um, Libya type op operation, no fly zone plus only air. Maybe that would be proportional. I'll assume that that's plus, uh, well, there'll probably be some ground forces. So I don't know. I, I'm going to assume a scenario of a very Libya type plus some um, ground forces. So proportionality means plus one, maybe? Plus two. <coughs> I'm going to put down as plus one. That's and the right conduct. Well, I mean, if we see forces in, in, in Syria and there's all kinds of attacks on them, you can't really give up. I'm sure they won't be entirely virtuous. Mind you, you know, it was amazingly successful in uh, Libya that 8,000 bombs were dropped and tragically uh, eight, uh, 80 to 100 people, civilians, were killed. But still, considering that, really, Marvel of the precision guided munitions allowed to serve so few casual uh, collateral damage or ca casualties. So right conduct, I don't know, we'll give it a plus one again. So um, if we're doing the overall evaluation, 
big factor is whether the Security Council will authorize an intervention in Syria. Uh, that will make a big difference to score, plus two or minus two. We have a big uh, difference of opinion about what the net benefit would be, and that's natural, that's a big unknown. I mean, you're, you're sort of throwing the dice uh, on moving Western forces into the Middle East. So that's certainly true. But overall, there's a kind of sympathy for this, a fairly positive score for Syria intervention. But maybe these, these ones are the, the no-goes to say, well, you just can't do it. Yep. How does the, um, how does the opposition to military force from um, the Syrian population factor into this? Because um, based on a lot of the news reports, um, Syrians are looking for a diplomatic solution to the problem. So looking at the Security Council to um, sort of broker agreements with Russia and China to come up with a diplomatic solution. They don't want the weapons because they're yeah. they're aware of, of the um, sort of the as I said the, the the difficulties of actually having um, an operations on the ground with, with forces the forces on the ground. So how does that factor into this, and how do we? Yeah. Well, we're, we're doing this as outsiders, looking at our humanitarian imperative for intervention, that sort of thing. You have to also see it from their point of view, but I think the population would be very divided on that. You know, you'd have some who would go, NATO come in as soon as possible, it's not too late. The other saying, no, definitely don't. We just give us arms. For those who are saying, no, don't come in here. We're just going to make the situation worse. So, uh, yeah, it's hard. It's not possible to do polling in, 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 in a war zone. So the, um, the, the just cause criteria, it's, it's based on our assessment. Yeah, because this is our, our evaluation, our ethical evaluation. If you want to try and put yourself in the other person's shoes, as I said, Bashar al Assad, well, what would you like? You could do that, right? Then, then you have to state that up front. You know, you know, and that. Okay, so that was, uh, that was our case of uh, Syria. Uh, the exercise. Now, I think we're going to get a lot more negative scores when we look at this one. So uh, Israel uh, sending an aircraft in to bomb Iran Iranian uh, nuclear facilities. Justice of the cause. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody want to go on the positive side just to make the argument? <laughs> well, you, I guess you could say the stock step was a, could be. You could say a stock step might have been a plus two. But not the bombing. The guy bombing. Yeah, right. like, yeah. So I mean, yeah, of course. this, this, in terms of the right, no, what is it? Um, Just cause. Sort of proportionality. All oh, right. right. And, yeah, I mean, that would be more, much cleverer. Yeah. Okay. So just to go, we don't think that they have the cause would be just because there's a presumption that in the future Iran may get a nuclear weapon. And so that's uh, not just. What about the right intent? What's uh, how would you evaluate Israel's intent? I mean, there's a self-defense element in there, so it's not completely minus three, but it's, uh, well, the motive for doing that is not for world peace, I don't think. Okay, so are you happy with zero or you want to go negative? Negative. 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 So minus one? Two. Minus two? Okay. Uh, <laughs> legitimate authority. Will, will, will Israel have the legitimate authority to conduct a bombing? No. 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 Minus three, so I'm going to minus the biggest of the negative of anything. Uh, now, I don't know about the Knesset. Has the Knesset given any kind of authorization for this? I don't think so. Right? I, 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 I heard some strong words from Okay, what would be the net benefit of an Israeli attack on? <laughs> I mean, you could you could put back Iran's nuclear weapons program or nuclear program back a year. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go minus two on that one. Last yeah. resort. Yeah. Last resort yeah, for. It's not last resort. We still got negotiations going on. Yeah. Then you have uh, then you have the saying, you know, if not now, when, you know. Uh, if you're when when it will if, if you're saying we need negotiations, how many more years? 
Okay, last resort we're saying minus two then, anyways. Uh, proportionality of means, so I'm assuming you're just dropping bonds on the nuclear facilities. Is anyone willing to give them a positive on any, <laughs> any of the criteria? Well, I mean, in that sense, if we narrow it that way, then that means, you know, we're talking about nuclear weapons, so I guess that's proportional. It's a nuclear facility that has centrifuges. Right. They're creating highly rich uranium, which can be used for both peaceful purposes and potentially for a future bomb. Would it be, would it be a proportion of means to, to drop bombs in that facility? Yeah, I have a bit of a problem with uh, saying that Iran cannot develop nuclear weapons when you know, half a decade ago India and Pakistan went at each other and tested nuclear weapons. Right. And that and that is also a security concern for the for the world because they may not cause you know trouble in the US, but they might fight each other and cause a larger conflict. Right. So and the, legit, the illegitimate authority to develop nuclear weapons is decided by the US and Israel. Uh, well, Israel well, has nuclear weapons. Israel has. Uh, but uh, the right. Iran has signed the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, so it would violate the treaty, or it would have to withdraw from the treaty uh, <coughs> if we're developing nuclear weapons. But well, what about India and Pakistan? They never signed the nuclear What about Israel? Never yeah. signed the nuclear But uh, I agree that that, that enters into the equation. That's the equation on our hands. But I, I'm going to look at proportionality of means. So uh, I would go for a plus one, but on that one particular score. But if anyone wants to say even that's not proportional, yeah, I think it's just one right. Yeah. I think it's plus right. one and right conduct. So um, when the Israelis dropped the bomb on Osirak, um, they killed uh, civilians. And when they dropped the bomb on the Syrian facility, uh, I think they also called civilian. So there was some collateral damage to less than half a dozen. But the right conduct. <coughs> Negative one. Okay, nice. All right, so let's just see. So here we don't have that many assumptions in here. And we're going, um, I would say we're probably, at least to cancel out, that's minus two, minus two. So we're at minus 2.5. So that's that's pretty unjust, which is what you know, you'd expect to come out of this uh, analysis. And I think it's uh, it just you know it allows us to go through the factors to consider what's what the ethical ones are, and you come up. What I like about this is you usually come up with a score that you intuitively feel anyways. All right, thank you for that. Uh, just that little thought experiment, and I can conclude. So the moral factors are important in in these um, issues of war and peace. It was Napoleon who thought that the uh, moral is three times more important than the physical. So when the soldiers have to go marching off to war, it's very important to ask them, well, is this trip just? And hopefully there will be some Israeli soldiers who when they're having to get in their jets will actually think about that question and may decide that the morality is more important than the aggression. And we'll constantly be weighing these issues between Mars and Venus, looking at the pros and cons, and this framework of the seven criteria gives us a useful means of, of, of weighing those things and beginning to quantify it. So the new components in this study, in this research, is the, uh, is the idea that we could quantify the just war criteria. And that brings me to the end, so. Hmm. I'll do that. Okay.